I was just willing to be there, right? And, and I think the, the reason I felt confident enough to even show up was because of the training that I did through the ICPA uh, and, and knowing that I knew that I knew that I knew if this person was subluxated, then reducing that subluxation would allow her body to work more efficiently and effectively and tap into that innate wisdom that regulates all of it. And I just said, man, if I can do it, then I'm going to show up and do it. Um, fortunately, I didn't you know, serve as a proctologist that day. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, it's really important that we show up. And I think that's, that's the big message. Uh, our next speaker is the host of Pathways to Family Wellness podcast. And I don't think you all know Maybe you do. What goes into setting that up and organizing it? It is not always a job that receives a whole lot of gratitude, but he does amazing work. It's Dr. Brendan Reardon. Uh, Avengers Infinity War movie, that's what that, uh, that song's for. Remember when they're out in space and they're going around, they're singing it, that's a fun one. Um, it is such an honor to be able to be up here with everyone. I feel very humbled. I was looking at the lineup and speaking with Amanda, who's my wife, and you know, I feel like in many ways she's more qualified than I am to be up here, but you know, I was very humbled to be able to be with so many amazing people to be able to be up here. This is incredible. Um, it's amazing to hear Justin talk about that the ICPA membership is nearing 7,500. Isn't that one? I mean, if you want to talk tipping point, how close is that to the tipping point, right? I mean, that's, that's one in 10 chiropractors, more or less, are ICPA docs in some way, which is absolutely amazing. And when you think about what goes into an organization like that, you might think, oh, there's got to be dozens of people, hundreds of people running an organization like that. I mean, it's a, it's a handful of dedicated, hardworking people. So if we can just give one more round of applause for all the ICPA staff. For... So without their support, the podcast never would have come to be. And I'll give that, I'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes here. Um, so my goal in the next, you know, the next... 18, 20 minutes that I've got here is to talk a little bit about what we've learned for our time in practice. Now, my wife and I have been in practice about 10 years, so we're not old salts by any mean, but it's also not our first time around the block, so we've figured some things out. She's figured things out easier than I have. I'm very much of the opinion that you only learn the hard way, and I feel like that's, you know, that's how I've learned a lot of the lessons that I've learned is the hard way. She's always been a little more smooth with a lot of those transitions. Um, and the practice is still evolving, so I'm not speaking to you from the place of like, hey, this is, we have figured it out, but more, we are always actively learning, actively growing, and actively changing. I feel like we're really just beginning the field of mastery at this point. At 10, at 10 years in, it really feels like we're just like scratching the surface of what it means to be a master in chiropractic, and I'm really excited for what the next 10, 20, 30 years are going to bring. Just by a show of hands, I'm curious where people are at in practice. How many students do we have in the room? All right. <laughs> Excellent. And what about first five years of practice? Anyone first five years of practice? Okay, cool. All right. Five to ten years? Anyone? Okay, nice. Ten to fifteen? There we go. They're all on that side of the room over there. Okay. Uh, fifteen to twenty? Even more. Good, good. And then uh, more than twenty. How many people more than twenty? There we go. Well done. That's cool. And I'm sure even the folks that have been in more than 20, which we could delineate it even more, 25 to 30, but it was neat to hear all of them yesterday share about some of the things that they had learned in their, in their time in practice. So that's Amanda and I, our picture there. That's before I had a beard. Like many of you, in the past couple of years, this beard suddenly appeared. How many other guys out there grew a beard in the past couple of years and the beard got bigger? I know Santos is one of them. <laughs> all right. Here we go. So our story... I'm in the fortunate situation where I'm able to practice with my wife. Um, how, many, how many people out there get a chance to either practice in one form or another? Either they're a chiropractor or they run the office in some way, get a practice with a spouse or a partner. That's cool. I feel like this is also very unique in the ICPA. You're going to see a lot of like husband and wife or partner teams that are put together in that way. There's something really unique about that, and I'm going to share a bit about this as well. We work very well in practice together, but that wasn't necessarily our intention 
when we were in school, we had several professors who were like, no, 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 you never want to practice with your, with your wife or your party. Because like, like, when, when shit goes down, it's going to be bad. You know? and, they were, and they were coming from the place of having it been through like, a bad situation and, and what that would mean. And so when Amanda and I first graduated, we really didn't have much of an intention of practicing together. We each kind of had separate things. Um, and then each of our separate things more or less fell, fell apart at the same time. And because I make decisions very quickly with very little thought, I'm more like, well, here's what we're going to do. We're gonna, we are going to find a place. We're going to at, look at some spaces, and, uh, and we're going to find a place we're going to practice together. And she said, no, we're not. And I said, yes, we are. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and uh, so I had just moved out from, uh, to kind of go a little more of a backstory. I'm a California native, originally born and raised in San Diego. Whoop, whoop. Yeah. <laughs> Amanda's from the Boston area, um, and she and I met in chiropractic college, so I met in chiropractic college. I'm older than she is, but she graduated a little bit before me. Chiropractic was a, uh, was a second career for me. So she finished first, moved back to the Boston area. We did long distance for a little bit, and then I decided to follow her back there just to see what it would be like. It was more like, this is just going to be a trial period. You know, we're going to see what living on the East Coast is like away from California, which for anyone that's from California... There tends to be this idea that like there is no world outside of California, which is a really, a really unique thing. And it's it's not surprising because California has just about everything you could want depending on where you are in the state. But it turns out there's 49 other states as well. So who knew? <laughs> um, so we move out to the Boston area and we have a, a winter beach rental in a, in a little cottage um, close to the water in Green Harbor, which is a place that colloquially is called the Irish Riviera. Um, which is basically a town where all the Irish from Boston bought their vacation homes, um, and it's a cute little beach town where we live to this day in Marshfield. So anyhow, we're moved out there. Each of our separate practice things sort of falls through at about the same time. And then on a whim, I'm looking at a map, and I'm like, well, let's just consider some spaces together. And I was like, uh, Norwell. I was like, yeah, let's see. It looks 53, close to a main road, by the freeway, seems like a nice community. Yeah, let's go look at some spaces there. You know, so very detailed demographic search of the community, uh, <laughs> as you can tell. And so we looked at a few spaces, ended up finding the space that we were in for about nine years. We just moved this past winter, and I'll, and I'll get to that. But ended up finding the space that day. It basically looks like a miniature schoolhouse, so I'll kind of um, I'll get to that. There we go. We don't necessarily have the front. Let me go back, actually, to the family one there. There we go, because this is important as well. So we ended up finding, finding the space that day. We thought people were moving, out of the, were moving into the space, and it wasn't going to be available, but it's this cute, little, this cute little space that looked like a miniature schoolhouse, basically, a small little miniature schoolhouse, so perfect for starting out. We ended up signing the lease. Amanda basically got sick that, n that night, right? Was it that night? Yeah, it was that night. Amanda got sick with anxiety because she was like, this is not what we're supposed to be doing. Signed the lease a week later. A month later, we had our doors open. A month after that, amazing surprise happened, and we found out we were having our first child was on the way. And uh, it was an amazing and just, I don't know, I'm tearing up about this. It was an incredibly intense time to be able to, like, scrap and build a practice when, you know, we were, we were broke out of school. Like, it was, a, it was a challenging time. So for anyone that's been through something like that, I just, you know, I want to give shout out to that. Like, we... We're out of school, a baby on the way. We're basically saying, like, oh, shit. You know, like, it was, <laughs> you know, it was, a, it was a, an intense time there. And, you know, we didn't even have enough money, basically, to have our own place. So we moved back into her parents' basement. Our first son was born in Amanda's parents' basement, a home birth in their basement, which her father was not down with. <laughs> but but, but <laughs> he's, a, he's a really interesting character. But we were basically so, like, Amanda's down in the basement, laboring, our, this is the following December, laboring away. Steve, who's my father-in-law, is upstairs just like drinking, like, oh, this is, this, you gotta go to the hospital, this is crazy, you know? He's <laughs> 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 but our amazing, our amazing little Oliver, our first son there, who's, uh, who's the big guy there, he's eight years old now, was born at home in the basement, and it was the kind of birth going into it where you think you think you have an idea because Amanda had read a lot of like Ina May's books and we'd studied so many things about birth. So you almost, you think you have an idea about how something's going to go and then the real experience happens. And I feel like we could really resonate when Justin was talking about his wife for their first child of like, I feel like I've been lied to. And it was, it was one of those type of experiences where the labor was really long, really intense. You know, the, the midwife was amazing who was there, but she wasn't very hands-on. So there was a lot of time where we were like, we don't, really know what we're doing here. 
Amanda had invited her friends to be there because she thought it would be cool to have her friends there. They're sitting on the couch like this while Amanda's here in the birth tub, like not, almost like this weird movie spectacle. They didn't, really know, they didn't really know what to do either. Like, what do we do? We're like, you're doing a great job, Amanda. You know, so, yeah. But it just, it went on and as long. So about 36 hours, um, and he was finally born. It was incredible. Her friends, in response to that, one of them was like, that was amazing, that was beautiful, I can't wait to have a baby. Another one got freaked out and went and got a puppy. That was her, <laughs> that was her response to that birth experience. And so we've got our first son, we're still living in, in the basement, you know, having this big vision of what it was going to be like to, to live as a doctor, but that, that had not physically manifested it yet. You know, the practice was just not financially profitable and not making things, and each of us going through school were very involved to the point where we were like, yeah, we're going to like get out there and, you know, we're going to make a million dollars our first year in and it's going to be amazing, but that wasn't how it had manifested yet, Right? And so I want that to be one of the big lessons is that even though it might not have immediately manifested for you now, that doesn't mean it's not in the process of manifesting, right? I think we can all remember and think of times in our lives where something hadn't quite appeared, but it might just be a few more steps down the row until that is going to appear. And that's where, that's where faith and trust comes in. So I'm, gonna, I'm running shy on time because I'm doing very long-winded explanations here, but that other little one, that fiery one, that's our Maley. Again, another one born at home, very different experience. Uh, we're well into practice at this point. I get the call in my office that, you know, Amanda's in labor, and we're thinking, like, well, it'll probably be similar to the first one. So she was like, yeah, don't, you know, don't rush too much. Don't worry about getting home too quick. You know, it's okay. So in my mind, I'm like, no problem. So I do my bank deposit. I'm driving home. Traffic on the freeway, there's Cape traffic. Patty uh, probably knows all about Cape traffic, you know. Uh, the Cape is a vacation spot in, the, in uh, the Massachusetts area, so there's a ton of traffic getting home. I finally get home. I'm like, oh, man, this baby's, this baby's coming. It was like, uh, like this was not going to be a 36-hour labor. So Maylee came at hot and heavy, very fast, about a six-hour labor start to finish. And I feel like that really defines her personality. She's now our middle child. Uh, we've got three beautiful little ones. This photo up here on the left was, uh, was taken March of this year when our, uh, our newest member, who Amanda's holding over there right now, was still baking away, um, about to be born. But she is very fiery. She's got curly red hair, and she fits every bit of it, and she can, uh, she can stand her own. Um, so one of the points I want to get to, here's our practice as well. Uh, this is the old space. Got some, haven't quite gotten photos of the new space yet. We love to see babies, love to see mamas. It's a fun loud family experience. We have a reputation with some of the other chiropractors in town, which I really enjoy this now, is that it's messy and it's loud. <laughs> I was like, that is perfect for a family practice, you know? The office gets cleaned regularly, but there's just, you know, there's only so much that can happen. That chalkboard right there, we did not bring a chalkboard into the new practice. Um, we thought, opening up, that we wanted to have everything just be open and free for the ultimate expression, you know, total freedom of expression you might want to put some boundaries on statements like that when you say total freedom of expression because a dog might walk in and take a dump in your office. <laughs> that happened. <laughs> I, see animal, I see dogs in the office, and that you know, dog gets adjusted, and right there, like, okay. Um, a chalkboard wall like that was really fun, but it makes for a lot of chalkboard mess, so quite a, quite a mess all over the place. So we were like, okay, we want some freedom of expression, but not the ultimate freedom of expression. We, had, um, we hosted different groups over the years. We had a Pathways Connect group there, which ended up not really being a Pathways Connect group and instead turning into just like total mayhem with kids running over, like coloring the walls with crayons, like spilling things on the floor. And I was like, wow, when there's like this much chaos, you really lose the focus of like, so like moms and the people in the group were not able to connect and share the content because there was so much chaos in the office. So another point I'd like to make is like, be careful what you wish for. You want to put boundaries on things like freedom of expression so that like, your office can be treated in a respectful way um, also. Okay, so finally we're to the first point here. <laughs> All right. Number one, this is really important for us. Know who you want to serve, then find and connect with those people. Right? So this is, for anyone that's going to build a family practice, it's really important to know who you want to take care of. Amanda was always very clear about that at the start. For me, it was a process of learning the hard way about figuring out who I didn't want to serve before I could finally realize who we did want to serve. Because getting out of school, you might think, like, well, I want to take care of everybody. And in a sense, like, when we have a big heart, there's a lot of truth to that, right? Like, we want to see everyone. We want to get our hands on everyone, just, just like, serve everyone and adjust everyone. But we don't 
really want to, like I realized, look, I don't really want to take care of like cranky old people. So like that's a, you know, that one, we can rule that one out. We love taking care of babies. That's a, that's a fun one. We want to take care of people that are respectful and kind and like-minded like us. So like what can we do to try to attract those people? So the tip number one, gain, gain clinical skills with those you want to serve. Uh, be a resource. Last night at dinner, Courtney and I and, and all of us were talking about this. Anytime we go out and enhance our clinical skill, there's always more of those people come into the office. I'm sure everyone can relate to that. If you go out and do a cranial seminar, all of a sudden a whole bunch of cranial cases are coming into your office. You do more about PEDS, more PEDS are coming into the office. So that was really big for us was just to enhance the clinical skill as much as possible. This is where the ICPA has been absolutely tremendous for me. Um, Amanda went through the, the ICPA courses going through school. She was very clear on her vision of who she wanted to serve. It took a few years for me getting out. It took some humbling experiences of not necessarily knowing how to adjust my own son and being very humbled by that. Our firstborn was born. You know, I go through some basic things which in my mind I thought was a good analysis, but there was really uh, lacking quite a bit of specificity in there. And so the ICPA for me was really incredible to help gain more clinical skill in that area. Be a resource as well. Your practice members, your patients, the people that come in to see you, they're going to count on you, especially during trying times like we've had in these past couple of years. In the past couple of years, we were, and I'm sure many other offices can relate to this, we were the only ones that stayed open. And so from like March of 2020 until June, July, August, nobody else was open. So people had no one else to turn to. We were the only, the only practitioners that kept their doors open in our, in, our, in our area. I know several of the chiropractors kept their doors open as well but so many things were falling off the radar and people were really counting on us in a resource and it felt like such a really, it was challenging, but it also was an incredibly nourishing time to be a chiropractor because we felt like, wow, like the whole world seems like it's lost its mind, but here in our quiet practice, it felt like this is our happy space. Like we can come in here, we can put our hands in pe on people, we can connect with people, help calm that nervous system just a bit, you know, just, just a notch to help them be able to see things a little bit differently and that was really powerful during those times. So about the podcast, um, we were a few years into practice, and like many of you, had several moms coming in who you think, this mom is extraordinarily healthy, you know, everything's going to go just fine, and then 37 weeks, 38 weeks, 39 weeks come around, and all of a sudden, things start going wrong, you know, and you're like, wait a second, everything seemed fine, but then these practitioners, these more conventional practitioners who are seeing them are basically laying on the fear. And so many moms who, in my opinion, like probably could have had a perfectly fine labor and delivery ended up having a lot of intervention used. And I was getting so frustrated a few years into practice of like, ah, if only, if only more people read Pathways. And so because I, you know, Pathways has been very influential for me as I raise my children and my practice as well. I find the, the magazine to be incredible. And I thought to myself, if only more people would read Pathways, then we could make different, different choices. You know, but I thought, well, people are really busy. The magazine format is awesome, but also people are busy. Surely there's a podcast. So I was like, there's a podcast for everything. There's got to be a Pathways podcast. So I you know, take out my phone and search through. Nope, there's actually no Pathways podcast. So at that point, I thought, huh. So I reached out to Jeannie. I said, how would you like it if, we, if I did a podcast? And she said, go for it. So we put together, it, we put together the podcast. It took several years of like, Here's me again doing the wrong thing before I figured out how to do the right thing. If, you, if one of you is interested in doing the podcast yourself, it's actually not that difficult if you do the right steps. If you do the wrong steps, it can be very complicated as I made it. I got all this fancy audio editing equipment thinking like, all right, I'm going to make a, I'm going to learn audio editing. And I was like, wait a second, I'm not an audio editor. This is, this is silly. So all this fancy equipment. In the end, Zoom is a great format with a decent microphone. It's very good. <laughs> Don't reinvent the wheel. If you're going to do something like that, you can record your podcast on Zoom with a decent mic and the quality is going to turn out great. Um, either, yeah, use, use Pathways podcast as a resource in your own practices or start your own, your own podcast. It's been powerful for our practice. We've had uh, one of the podcast issues was questions to ask a midwife during an interview. And several of our moms who were contemplating a home birth have used that episode where basically I'm interviewing our local home birth midwife and she's walking through with questions, all of the common questions someone might have who's considering a home birth. Like, you know, like the common ones like, is it safe? Are they properly trained? What if something goes wrong? All that kind of stuff is all answered in that interview. So if you have other moms that are contemplating things like that, use that episode as a resource. Another one is Amanda and I recently shared our birth stories. Now, in that one, we had a, a, a mom in very recently who was starting care, and she said she listened to that episode, and that helped affirm her choice about having a home birth. And for me, I was like, this is why we're doing what we're doing. So to empower people coming in, 
before they're even under care, she came and she was like, I listened to that episode and I want exactly, like, that's what I want. I want to be able to have those experiences like what you shared in your podcast. And I thought, this is, like, this is why, this is why we're doing what we're doing here. That's, uh, that's my baby Russell, our, our newest one right there on the right. Number two, I'm going to be real quick here. Connect with other practitioners who care for the people you want to serve. There's more of them out there than you think. Believe it or not, there are more like-minded practitioners, and they're also looking for you. SLPs, OTs, PTs, chiropractic is a crucial portion of that overall health and wellness picture for so many of these kiddos that are getting all these other services, but they're not getting checked to see if they're subluxated. This is a crucial part of the picture. These practitioners are also looking for you. Find them. Refer to them. And then manifest it. So I'm going I'm to end with this real quick. Um, this is a photo of, so we, we were very busy during the pandemic. We bought a house, we got a Peloton, we got a puppy, we had a baby, and we moved our practice. So it has been a, busy, been a busy couple of years. We did it all. So we were moving out of one home into another home, um, and we put together a list and almost had forgotten that we put this list together. Only recently, the past year, we found this list of the home we currently live at. And basically, every single thing that's on that list, for the most part, is on our new home. And it was one of those things where you write it down, you manifest it. I'm a huge fan of manifestation. Everything starts in the mind. Thoughts become things. That's a Mike Dooley quote, but thoughts become things. Everything starts in the mind. It starts up here. If you can get this space clear about what you want, everything else is going to follow. Thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate it. <laughs>